Welcome to Kibbe on Liberty. You got presents there, don't you? Yes, I'm not. If you notice, I'm not wearing precious. I've decided to keep precious new in the box. Yeah. Uh, this is probably the only congressional pen that's still in its wrapper. Yeah. Because we're uh, 10 days into Congress, and we were given these 10 days ago. So, uh, you know, these will bring more on eBay if they're in the wrapper, I think. Now, you, you've, you've talked eloquently about how putting precious on um, – is, is so fundamentally corrupting that, that you, you become to start to feel more important than you actually are. When you take this pen and put it on your lapel, your IQ goes up 50 points. <laughs> uh, your power is just like police in Washington, D.C. get out of your way. Yeah. Uh, you walk around metal detectors. You don't walk through them. You go to a restaurant and they seat you at the front immediately. Uh, this is it is like precious in that people come here as hobbits and then they put on the ring and then they become Gollum. Yeah. And uh, I'm resisting the urge to open what would be I think this would be my sixth precious because mm -hmm. uh, you get one every two years. At some point, it's going to get you like oh, you're you're self-aware, but it's going to get you. By the way, the, the spouse gets a precious, too. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> they, it's a franchise that the whole family can enjoy. Now the the kids get a little badge yeah. that let them go get the run of the capital. Um, I actually think when you walk outside, uh, it makes you a target too. Yeah. Like if you're just disgruntled and you want to take out some congressmen, you you aim for the pen. Or if you're looking for like a an earmark or an appropriation, sure. I suppose. <laughs> beseech that man. He <laughs> has earmarks. <laughs> <laughs> so your theory is if you keep it in the plastic, it, it'll be less corrupting. Have you considered, like, so. pinning the actual plastic bag? <laughs> <laughs> I did. <laughs> yeah, I keep it like this. I did I did walk into the Capitol the other day, and the guard didn't recognize me, and I didn't have a precious on. And uh, rather than be tackled by a bunch of guards, uh, I, I pulled this out and showed it to them. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I keep them in the wrapper so they bring more on eBay. And I, I, I don't did know if the guard... Did, thought I was serious. Do the, do the guards know that you're kind of difficult, that you don't like to wear the pin, and they're like, oh, there's there's crazy Massey. Well, just mean, let him buy. Um, I, you know, the guards have to stay ecumenical and apolitical, but you can kind of tell there are some that are uh, want to get sassy with Massey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is, a, this is a problem you have in Washington generally, I suspect. Yeah. Why aren't you playing along? That there's there's rules in this town and you you seem to be breaking them like you know so for instance we voted on a congressional gold medal for the capitol hill police and i voted against it and you would think that they would all hate me because that's you know the democrats would try to gin that up but the guards are actually you know they're in dc they hear conversations all the time they know what's going on yeah and when i explained that look you the text of that resolution called everybody insurrectionists who were here that day and that if if uh, a prosecutor has the imprimatur of congress saying that this is an insurrectionist that could bear on their case and so i'm not going to vote for a resolution that could affect some grandma's case because she took an unguided tour where the cop waved her in um, so anyways the guards understand that subtlety there was um, this that you you bring up a subject which is not the subject that I want to talk about today, but this this abuse <laughs> of language, like throwing casually throwing around words like terrorist, insurrectionist. Um, it it seems to be a disease in this town where like we keep escalating to say the most outrageous thing, but the the, the words become meaningless because we right. do that. And I I used to use the word coup to describe our efforts to get rid of John Boehner. And, it, you know, I was a part of all three coups to remove John Boehner, but you can't even joke about that word now. Because yeah. they've, they're trying to seriously apply it to some disgruntled protesters who were unarmed and, you know, showed up at the Capitol. Yeah. 
Well, let's let's talk about the the Boehner coup in the context yeah. of of this this last week has been one of the most dramatic I've seen in Washington for a long time. The the three or four day argument about who would be the the new the new Republican speaker and the results of that. But you're you're like an old hand at causing leadership endless headaches. The the three words motion to vacate would not be passing the lips of anybody this century if uh, Jim Bri- Congressman Jim Bridenstine and I hadn't talked to somebody at the Congressional Research Service and, and dug this thing up, it hadn't been used in over 100 years, and um, decided to do a motion to vacate on John Boehner. Now, it turned out Mark Meadows got disgruntled and w- was the implementer of the motion to vacate, but I wrote the final draft of the motion to vacate that got rid of John Boehner and put it in the hopper. And uh, here's what I found out in that third coup. So I was a part of all three coups, if I may use that word lightly, because people have lost their sense of humor up here. Yeah. In the third effort to remove John Boehner, we succeeded because of this motion to vacate, which we never implemented. We put it in the hopper and started getting co-sponsors on the motion to vacate, which had never been done in the history of Congress. It's usually something you walk up to the microphone and recite. We decided to put it, write it down and put it in the hopper, all of our grievances. We, uh, John Boehner resigned the day after the Pope spoke, uh, uh, roughly two months after we introduced the motion to vacate. Kevin McCarthy was, in 2015, supposed to be the next Speaker of the House. I had encouraged and campaigned for Daniel Webster, who had been the Speaker of the House in Florida, and the president of the Senate in Florida, third most populous state, uh, you would, you know, it's not any small task to have done that. He was very qualified for the job, and he wasn't ideological. He wanted to change the way Congress worked. He wanted us to follow our rules instead of suspending our rules every day. And that resonated with me, even though his voting record and mine were pretty different. Yeah. So we ran, uh, Daniel Webster ran against Kevin McCarthy, and what happened is Kevin did not have the votes to become Speaker. And instead of bringing it to the floor, by the way, he had to bring it to the floor this time. You can't take a pass twice. He resigned from the race, Kevin did. And instead of uh, Daniel becoming the Speaker, he was going to reform things, this guy named Paul Ryan, who had run for president, and everybody publicly thought he was a raging conservative. Most of us on the inside knew better. He he was chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. He rose to the front and they put him on the white horse and the Freedom Caucus switched, no indictment of them, switched their support from, and not all of them, there were a dozen who didn't, switched their support from Daniel Webster to Paul Ryan. We ended up with Paul Ryan I can't blame Paul Ryan for every bad thing that happened while he was Speaker, but there were some bad things that happened that made the institution worse. Yeah. We ended up with uh, no ability. He ended the ability to offer amendments on spending bills to cut spending on the floor. He, he ended that. And we haven't had a vote on cutting spending on a spending bill in seven years. That, uh, you know, It ended under Paul Ryan. So here's what the reason I'm going through that is not to make an excuse and to say, well, it wasn't worth trying to take out Kevin this time, but to, to sort of punctuate the fact that you can change the person, but if you don't change the place, the way this place works, you very well could get the same results or worse. And so within this group of 20 and a half people, um, there were actually two groups, uh, which is what I'm telling you, I'm not betraying any trust, is it was observable mm-hmm. to anybody from the outside back in December. Kevin said, you know, wh- what's your advice to me? And I said, you got two groups over there. You got the ones that aren't going to vote for you come hell or high water. And then you got the ones that want to change this place. And I would, uh, sooner rather than later, which that party then take an advice <laughs> sooner rather than later this was the second week of december go yeah. work with the ones who want some concessions yeah and uh it, it had to be a fight there had to be a fight it's kind of like there's wars like maybe the war in ukraine which you and i've discussed whenever that's over whatever the settlement is it's almost certain that both sides would have been better off not having gone to war um but they couldn't 
it's maybe human nature. There had to be a fight before the other side knew that each was serious. And so that's what happened on the floor. Um, as it evolved, the rebels uh, took a while to develop their narrative. Like some would go on TV and they'd say, okay, what do you want? And well, we don't know what we want. Yeah. <laughs> but that was part of the problem was there, there were 20 individual free thinking people in that group and they all did kind of have different thresholds and, and, and different outcomes they were desiring, but they eventually came together on a group of things, a rough framework for an agreement where conservatives wouldn't be marginalized for the next two years. And um, I was in the meetings with the rebels uh, and in the meetings when they met with Tom Emmer's group, uh, which he's the majority whip and he, he he and his staff were, seemed to be, and McCarthy's staff, obviously, were there, seemed to be most interested in landing the plane. So instead of, like, and I've, I've watched this from the outside, and, and I was pretty involved with you in that first coup attempt, and I'll, I'll yes. abuse the English language Let's as well. Let's use the word coup. Um, cause, because it does feel like for all of that work to, to take on leadership, it's, it's like, you know, uh, here's the new boss, same as the old boss kind of thing. And I, I suspect, I don't even know who's in Congress anymore. I'm happily ignorant of, of many of these guys, but I suspect that there's a dozen guys, just like Kevin McCarthy, sort of queued up should he fail to get that. Um, and it's this clash between um, people like you and, and, and Tea Party guys and Ron Paul guys and, and people that, that got elected to Congress almost completely independent of, of the leadership's control. Like the leadership packs didn't help them. Maybe they actually went after them. And so you have all these independent voices. And, and the, re, the, the response from leadership, starting with John Boehner, was to, to crack the whip, not realizing that he didn't have the power that he used to have. So the, the dust has not really settled yet, but um, it is your contention, and it, I think Chip Roy's as well, that you guys got some substantive commitments for process change um, on things like budgeting and and the subcommittee. What are we calling the subcommittee? It's so, it's it's a mouthful. Uh, the, I call I call it the church committee. The but. select the select subcommittee on the weaponization of federal government. Yeah, and um, that's that's the name. To you know, I think it's appropriate to. Uh, liken it to the Frank Church Committee. Uh, but that's, you know, that committee was already sort of conceptualized before this brouhaha for Speaker. What happened, though, in the, in the Speaker negotiations was that uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Representative Dan Bishop from North Carolina, focused in on this committee and said, all right, we need as part of these concessions, we need to make sure this isn't a fake committee. We need to get assurances. And some of the assurances that were secured in those negotiations while the speaker vote was happening um, were basically assurances that uh, conservative libertarian leaning person like me would be on the committee, that um, if we, so it's a subcommittee under uh, judiciary. And there's some reasons why you might want to do that. For instance, if the FBI is reluctant to give you documents, we also authorize their funding, right? So um, also, if the subcommittee finds something that is illegal or unconstitutional and there's a legislative remedy, the remedy exists within the Judiciary Committee. So there was some debate over whether this should be a subcommittee within that committee or whether it should be its own select committee off to the side, which sometimes these select committees are and uh, have more freedom or latitude. Well, within this select subcommittee, what uh, Dan Bishop and I were able to get, get uh, assurances of is were that we could go beyond the jurisdiction of Judiciary Committee, that even though it's a select subcommittee of Judiciary, if we start pulling on a string at the FBI and it leads to CIA, we have the authority to receive those classified documents and um, to review them and go wherever the investigation leads. That's pretty significant. Otherwise, 
I can imagine you might take one or two steps and bump up against the wall and, oh, you're not allowed to go there. Yeah. So we got the authority to go into uh, other domains outside of judiciary as long as civil liberties are being abused. Uh, it's, you know, we don't need the nuclear submarine secrets, okay? We're, we didn't ask for authorization of that. I'm pretty sure we're not using nuclear submarines to infringe on American civil liberties. If well, we are, we got bigger problems. Well, well yet. I mean, right. <laughs> it's, it's on the drawing board, but we're not there yet. Right. Uh, by the way, the, the Democrats disparaged this committee yesterday in the debate. There, there's another select committee called the China Subcommittee, uh, and we, that was a bipartisan vote. You know, it's very popular to be against China right now. And I, by the way, I turned to uh, Matt Gates and as everybody, Rah, China, China, China. And I said, you know, the ironic thing is every congressman in this room is probably wearing an article of clothing from China. Yeah. And uh, Matt Gates turned over his tie and it said made in China. And I turned over my tie and it said made in China. And we're like, yep. <laughs> uh, but anyways, uh, the only reason I bring up the China Committee, I don't want to spend any time on it, is there was a bipartisan vote for it, but there was not a bipartisan vote for the Select Subcommittee on the Weaponization of the Federal Government against the American people. It was a party line. And the Democrats said, we don't need it. Uh, one of the arguments made by Chairman Schiff, former chairman of the Intel Committee, is, oh, if you go poking around there, they're not going to want to give us the information we need later on to legislate, you know, oh, you know, within their domain. And I got up and I said, listen, if there's anybody over there who is reluctant to let us perform our oversight function, we're the, we're the branch that created them, funded them, and we're responsible for their oversight. And if, they, if that's the existence proof, if, if they're reluctant, for why this needs to happen now. And it's actually, I didn't say this, but it's actually also proof that he hasn't been doing it. At Kibbe on Liberty, freedom is a lifestyle 24-7, something you live and breathe and wear every day. If that describes you, you need the very best Liberty swag in the market today, just like this shirt I happen to be wearing. Go to freethepeople.org slash KOL and check out our exciting merch. You too can love Liberty and look cool. Yeah, I was going to say, like, it, it strikes me that the necessity to create this uh, special subcommittee is is a scathing indictment of the failure of Congress to do its job. Because That's, that's the uh, title of my speech yesterday on the House floor. Two, two glorious minutes of it. You know, if uh, this is the existence proof. Their argument was the existence proof of why it needs to exist. And they're trying to call it the tinfoil hat committee. Yeah. Well... I think we'll find things, and I think they're going to regret. I found I found a, I won't I don't remember who the congressman is, but a Democratic congressman was. Uh, this must have been a floor debate yesterday. Uh, breathlessly said in the New York Times, "This committee is nothing more than a deranged ploy by the MAGA extremists who have hijacked the Republican Party and now want to use taxpayer money to push their far right conspiracy nonsense." And. It strikes me that they're objecting too much. Like that. they're kind of saying, you know, we. I said if we're going to get exposed because we didn't do our basic responsible function. I quoted Shakespeare, which I've never done in a speech on the floor. <laughs> I'm not a fond. That's pretty highbrow of you. Yeah, I, know. I think when people start quoting other things, they should just insert a footnote into their speech, and then we can go find it later. Yeah. But it was the, the sentence I quoted was, "The lady doth protest too much, methinks." Yeah. Uh, I mean, is, this is, I will make every effort n not to give them the ammunition to marginalize this committee like that. So, yeah. for instance, let's talk about some things that aren't in the purview of this committee. It, this is about civil liberties, and civil is also the root word of civilian. We're not talking about politicians. We're not talking about where any government officials' rights infringed. And, and and that's what they're going to say. Oh, you're trying to relitigate the election. No, I am so beyond that. I was beyond it on January 3rd, three days before January 6th. Chip Roy and I issued a, a, a letter saying that um, we sh it wasn't our job to make this kind of judgment call about the election. We, our job was to decide were the, the, these the electors the state sent, not were these the electors they should have sent. 
Like d d to the degree that we adjudicate elections, that's it. We just did the electors get mugged on the way to DC? Are these the imposters? And it turns out they weren't. We don't get to go inside of the state's elections. And I know I'm probably making some of your listeners uncomfortable by saying this, but uh, I hope, I don't know if he will be, but I would hope Chip Roy is on this subcommittee too, because they can't, they can't say we are syncophants that, because we voted to certify the election. Yeah. They're trying to they're trying to marginalize this committee and say it's something it's not. By the way, they just the other thing that we secured in the charter language for this subcommittee is a, a very strong statement that we can investigate, we can get information about ongoing uh, criminal investigations. We like that's the big thing they always throw up the DOJ. Oh, it's not our policy to tell you. Okay, well. It's our policy to get that information, and we created you, okay? So we established that, and I heard from the Democrats yesterday in the floor debate, the, the, the pearl clutching, oh my gosh, ongoing investigations. Like, why, why would Congress ever get involved in an ongoing investigation? This is way out of bounds, and it's unprecedented. And I had to get up and point out that their January 6th committee involved at least a hundred ongoing investigations that they were overlapping with. So there is a precedent. The, the difference is we're not, we aren't trying to relitigate a political event. We're, we are trying to um, find out, follow, we, we, we already know from the Twitter files and from the, the, when the FBI tried to establish the disinformation board when the FBI created threat tags for uh, parents that go to school board meetings, we already know they're doing this. Yeah. So um, it's not, these aren't conspiracy theories. It's, it's amazing to me. It, it's, um, and I don't know if you have an opinion about this, but I, I, I wikied the church committee this morning. And as I recall, <laughs> the, this, that um, committee, I don't know if it was a subcommittee or how it was structured, but um, it passed the Senate 88 to four, something like that. It was not. It was not a partisan thing, even though it was chaired by a Democrat. But, but Republicans participated in that. And and one of the one of the programs that you may recall was something called Mockingbird, which um, sounds eerily familiar because it was um, the FBI um, looking at the metadata of telephone companies and forcing them to give over all of that data so that they could um, spy on civilians. And I'm like, well, that sounds familiar. This, did, did they ever, like, so, so we went through all that in, I guess this was 77, we did that. And, and, and since then, um, not much has changed. If anything, it, the, the, the intelligence state has become more intrusive on Americans' lives. And, and I'm, I'm obsessed about the Twitter files. Like, the, imagine like how many FBI agents were, were reading the tweets of some guy that, that made a joke about, about Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. Like, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Why, why, why are they doing that? Why are they allowed to do that? Well, back to your original, uh, th or your first thought, um, things have gotten a bit worse, like with the Patriot Act, for instance, they were just chomping at the bit after 9-11. It's pretty obvious that they didn't just dream all that up in a few weeks, that they had... It was ready. It was ready. And why was it ready? Because they were already doing those sorts of things, and they wanted to see CYA, and they had complicit congressmen who would do the work for them. And what they created was a, a lattice of legality that's unconstitutional like the contortions and the FISA stuff where you know where you can collect information because you're in pursuit of somebody who doesn't have civil liberties let's say a foreigner overseas but in the pursuit you because you're pursuing them as hard as you can you collect everything and now because the the person you were pursuing was didn't have civil liberties all the information that you collected incidentally you claim that you they claim and, and congress is sort of blessed that you don't need the uh to follow the constitution to query that database that's just ridiculous so 
And this is, you know, I've got Democrat friends on the other side of the aisle, like Zoe Lofgren and Ro Khanna, and I hope I hope they will get one of those five slots on this committee because I have co-sponsored legislation with those folks. They know it's happening. Like, are they, are, is Zoe Lofgren a conspiracy theorist? Like, is Ro Khanna a conspiracy theorist? Thank you for joining me today on Kibbe on Liberty and for being part of our fiercely independent audience. Every week, my organization, Free the People, partners with Blaze TV to bring you this show. My guests bring smart perspectives on everything from current events to timeless philosophical debates. If you like what you hear, go to freethepeople.org slash KOL and support Kibbe on Liberty so we can continue to produce these honest conversations with interesting people. Now, let's get back to it. Yeah, shout out to Rokana, and I, I remember I've, I've had conversations with you about work that you've done with him, but in the Twitter files, I recall him being one of the few Democrats that actually raised constitutional questions about, about this process of, of, of dictating to or collaborating with social media to determine who's allowed to say what. Yeah, it seems like in the Twitter files, there were a few people at Twitter who were uncomfortable and trying to raise flags. Hey, this feels a little wrong. <laughs> this, if somebody ever sees this, uh, they might think this, you know, yeah. which is a good way of saying it when you know what you're, what's happening is wrong. Yeah. And the people you're associating with aren't going to accept it. Just say, well, it kind of looks like this. And Ro Khanna, he's, he's, he's the only member of Congress who shows up in that kind of stuff. Yeah. So um, I hope he's on that committee. I, I'm i not sure that he will be. I've talked to him. I encouraged him to do it. Um, but for them to just totally write off the committee and disparage it as the tinfoil hat committee or that <laughs> mouthful of words you just said. It's, it seems like that's almost AI. Like they're they're just spitting these things <laughs> yeah, out. They, not even a good AI. They have yeah. They 1980s have nineteen eighties <laughs> Eliza AI. They have their talking points, and it's it's like they're all bots on Twitter, where like they just regurgitate the same things. And it's um, by the way, they're um, these aren't conspiracies either. But you'd have to be a fool not to anticipate that people will try to discredit me personally over the next two years sure and that there will be uh we know the fbi leaks to new york times and elsewhere like that's not a conspiracy either james comer did it um when he was disgruntled about being dismissed uh, and those are efforts to cont uh, control a narrative and to uh sort of sculpt the terrain into which the things we find out are uh, deployed. They, they, you know, they're going to try to curate our experience mm -hmm. by telling us which part of the library we can visit and trying to convince us there's no more shelves in the library. Um, they're going to uh, control the work environment. It's in a skiff, a lot of the stuff. They're going to say, oh, you can't, your personal staff can't see this. Uh, you know, all that's going to be curated. The they're going to try to front run all the releases. This I anticipate, and if you don't, you're not qualified to be on the committee. Yeah, you know, it strikes me that going back to the uh, we we now know a lot of the the shenanigans that that the intelligence state used to manipulate the media narrative back in the the, the 60s and 70s um, that led up to the Church Committee. But it, it seems like they're now embedded in the media. Like it's hard to tell sometimes the difference between CNN, a CNN analyst and, and an FBI or a CIA operative. It's like, it's like the same thing. Um, so I, I, I think you should probably go on the record that you don't feel suicidal <laughs> in any way right now. <laughs> I am not suicidal. I'm, very, I'm a very happy guy. Especially when I've got coffee. Because we'll, we'll be reading all of these hit pieces about you and other members of the committee. And, you know, it'll be it'll be leaked without attribution. And then someone on CNN is going to go on and say, well, I've heard this. And so we know how this is going to play out. But maybe it's too obvious now. Maybe yeah. maybe people won't take it seriously. Thank goodness I married my high school sweetheart. Like, <laughs> uh, 
I don't know what what kind of stuff, but in in the other thing, the other vector here is going to be foreign actors. Uh, you're probably not going to get too many steps into this before you find some coordination with a foreign government, and they're not constrained. Like at least if I'm investigating the investigators, th there's there's some hopefully outrage if we discover that the investigators that I'm investigating are now trying to counter investigate, right? But this, again, the weaponization will probably involve foreign actors who aren't constrained yeah. by our laws or constitution. Um, it'll, it'll get interesting. So what's your, what's your take on, I mean, <laughs> again, I, I'm not suicidal. Do you want, <laughs> I have two jobs, two new jobs in my office, so two new job openings, food taster and car starter. <laughs> I assume that's John's job to start your car. <laughs> yes. But you, but you drive a Tesla, so like it, I assume wire and gas I'm up driving up other different. different vehicles every day. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what is your take? Like we, we've argued about this on, on the show. I've never asked you this, but this – this question of whether or not, you know, the, the lazy libertarian response to social media censorship is it's a private company that can do what it wants. Well, we now know that this, that, that that's not really what's going on, that you have these incredibly powerful government entities, starting with the um, Biden administration. And by the way, before that, the Trump administration was doing the same thing, trying to dictate what was allowed to be said about co their COVID policies. So this is not a partisan thing at all. Um, but, you, you know, you have these very powerful people calling up um, social media companies and saying, I don't like that post. Um, now, a lot of these guys, like a lot of the guys at Twitter, sort of wanted to do it because it, it, it reaffirmed their ideological mm -hmm. um, priors. But this strikes me that this, this is, this is a, a collusion of government and business, which we used to think was a very bad thing. Um, but, but business is still the junior partner in this relationship. Mm -hmm. they're, 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 they're getting an offer they can't refuse when they say, take that post out. Do you, do you do you think that's true, or do you think that the, the social media companies are equally complicit? Um, well, the, by the way, I the don't even know what I think the no, answer to this is. Do, no, you're right. There's there's this melding of government and private entities, and there needs to be a bright line, I think, between the two. Because at the end of the day, a government has a monopoly on legal violence, like. There's only, there's only one entity on this planet that could shoot you and you die and it's legal. Yeah. Okay. It's the government. All right. They, they have a monopoly on force. And that's why the, you know, the founders chained that down as many ways as they could with, with the civil liberties that are guaranteed in the constitution. But, and then you have the private actors who, have uh, don't have those don't, don't have the constraints of the federal government about you know they can censor you it's not it's not considered an infringement of the first amendment if a private company censors you but what happens when these two start working together and uh, I think what you see in the Twitter files is they got so comfortable working together that people in in that group that working group for forgot that once you become one once the collaboration becomes that tight you have now created something that never should have existed something that can shoot you yeah and something that can put you in a cage and something that can censor you um and that's where we got to i'm i'm glad elon bought, bought twitter and released this but you'd have to be a blooming idiot to think it's not happening at Facebook or at Google yeah. or anybody that controls the, the curation and production of information through a search engine or whatnot. It was, um, I feel like Twitter might have been, I, I've read all of this, but there's so much of it, but it, I feel like Twitter was the, 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 the gatekeeper communicating 
um, with Google and Facebook. And the FBI was the government gatekeeper, but there were other alphabet agencies, including the CIA, euphemistically called something else at the time. Look, <laughs> this is the this is the open part of it, the outwardly facing people who clock in in a cubicle at FBI mm -hmm. that talking to people at Twitter who knew those were FBI people. Like one of the, one of the best things about Elon letting go, I don't know what percent of the staff was let go, but I guarantee you, um, like, you know, I'll bet my farm on it, that uh, there were relationships between Twitter employees and, and foreign actors that maybe the Twitter employees didn't know about, right? If you're, if you're one of three or four nation states, this is what you do. Yeah. You, I mean, and there's almost no limit to what they do. They're not constitutionally bound like another nation state. They're, they consider it necessary to the exist to their existence. These countries do that they are here spying, but also it's possible within our own government that relationships were curated with Twitter employees that um, the they were into their computers and Twitter didn't know it. Like there's another level below this. You can call it conspiracy theory. I just call it what other countries do and what our own country does in the name of national security that doesn't bear watermarks, you know, right? If it does, they're rank amateurs. Yeah. Yeah. These were these were the rank amateurs at what's happening. But what what I realized when Elon Musk let go of hundreds or thousands of employees is he severed carefully curated pipelines into a company that controls a, a narrative and those pipe you know those pipelines probably our own government and you know, this happens at newspapers too like the FBI has their favorite reporters to release stuff to they don't send them, you know, th through their regular emails. Uh, hey, can you do this? And New York Times reporter, yes, I'll write a story to do that. That's that's like amateur hour. That's what we're seeing at Twitter is the mm -hmm. amateur hour level of that. Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier, I, I want to pivot a little bit because you mentioned earlier um, the parents that were um, showing up at school board meetings and, and complaining about... Um, their local school boards policies and how they're educating their children. What, what, what do we know so far about, about what the FBI has, has been doing to those parents? That they, uh, well, that it was at the request, you know, there were, they made it look like there was a letter that was sent from the, you know, national school yeah, some alphabet nonprofit. Group yeah, sent it to there to give the appearance that they were requesting this from the government, but even that request was curated by the executive branch. So there's already there's already some funny business going on there to, to make it look like they requested it. But then um, it's a counterterrorism unit within the FBI, like not the appropriate <laughs> you know, title or place. Probably not their charter. Yeah. Um, and they created... A Speaking of the abuse of language, frustrated parents at failing schools are being pursued by a terrorist unit. Yeah. And then <laughs> they create, created a tag to track this EDU official. Um, and I'll tell you, I'm not an expert in it. I'm not a subject matter expert. If you had Jim Jordan here, he could, be, he could better explain it to you. But um, that's what I know. And is is that something you guys will Absolutely. be looking at? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, so that's an example of something we'll look at. Hunter Biden's laptop is not an example. Of, it's an example of something we would not look at. Was did the FBI fall down on the job there? Yeah. Were they? Was it part of a program to infringe on American civil liberties? Not necessarily. Now you could probably find some things where somebody tried to talk about Hunter Biden's laptop at Twitter and got censored, okay, that's a civilian who's trying to express an opinion and their First Amendment was infringed. That would be in it, but asking the FBI, why didn't you 
you know, or the DOJ, why didn't you pursue a prosecution when you knew this was real? Not, not inside of the purview of this committee. What, what other big issues do you think take priority? I would, uh, I'm reluctant to make a list, but as an example, um, of, of how broad this could be, the, the DOJ, FBI, ATF created this form. They had no congressional authorization to do it, where you could sign away your gun rights. And if you signed this, they just threw you in the next background check system and made you a prohibited person. There was no statutory authorization for that. Why did they create that form? And, and people, they gave it to people and people signed it. Now, why would you sign such a form? Probably because, I mean, I, you were facing a threat, and if, you're, if the threat is there and you're doing something to get out from under that threat, there's, where's the court? Where's the adjudication? Like, that to me is an infringement of civil liberties. Now, it's a, it's a Second Amendment. I want to know, um, how do you get put on the no-fly list, the secret no-fly list? What's the process? Is there a form somewhere and somebody can type your name in? Is there an algorithm? What, what are we searching for to put Americans on that list? I'm not talking about, you know, foreign visitors or whatever, you know, foreign people in foreign lands. Knock yourself out on that stuff. That's not, that's not in, in the, our domain. But the fact that an American shows up on that list, how do they get on that list? And now they, they show up at the airport and they can't travel? So th that's another example. But those are examples. Those are just because I'm listing things doesn't mean that's where it's limited to. Sure. And what I think I look forward to open sourcing the ideas for this. Eventually, it's, it's incumbent on us to prove this committee is real and that it could protect whistleblowers because, uh, you know, police, a lot of crimes get solved just because the somebody turns themselves in or there's an informant, okay? They're, they're really not that good in investigating. And I'm gonna admit to you, uh, I, I think we'll probably, once we demonstrate a competency and ability to protect whistleblowers, that we'll have people come to us. And if I were on the outside saying, is this a committee I can trust? I might say, well, that guy who on March 27, 2020, was the only one of 435 people who would walk on the floor of the House and demand a quorum during COVID and have his own president screaming at him in the middle of his election, of, you know, probably going to lose his election, but he felt convicted, you know, and his principles required him to do that because the Constitution calls for it. I might trust that guy to, to go to him. And so I hope people will trust me and there are other good people on the committee, and but we've got to establish that trust and pr and produce some results. I think and a track record. It's going to be hard to do, but once you get going, I think it could. Uh, we could get access to more information. So what's the timeline? You you apparently have a pretty ironclad commitment that you are on the committee, but it sounds like the committee hasn't been fully seated yet. And so what, what's the timeline? When do we know who it is and when do you guys start doing work? So yesterday we passed a resolution that establishes this committee. Um, the committee will be populated. It's a select committee, which means the steering committee doesn't decide. It's, it, the formula is the ranking member of judiciary and the chairman of judiciary will be on the committee is sort of ex officio. There will be eight uh, Republicans, and then there will be five members. By the way, all of the members are chosen by Kevin McCarthy. The, the five, but there are five chosen in con consultation with minority member or minority leader. Um, that would be Hakeem Jeffries. Um, and so there'll be five Democrats, eight Republicans. The committee needs to be constituted with members. And then I anticipate, like our other committees, usually the first meeting is a debate on the rules for the committee itself. Each committee in Congress has its own set of rules. We'll have to resolve things like if we come across classified information that needs to be released to the public, what's our preferred method of doing that? Um, 
that, you know, and work that out. I think obviously once the rules for the committee are established, you can modify them going forward, but it's hard to do. So I think it's going to be important that meeting where we establish the rules. And then we start with the request for information. I mean, we'll, we'll start with what's publicly known and then issue requests and we'll probably they'll probably try to turn down every one of our requests. The silver lining, and this, I'm told this from lawyers, I'm, I haven't done the diligence on this, but lawyers I trust say there's a silver lining to the January 6th committee and that they got a lot of information and they had to go through court to get it and there's precedent established for getting this information. So in a strange sort of way, their, you know, their show committee uh, has produced a pathway to information for us, at least legal precedents. And if we go to the same courts and the same judges, we can expect the same decisions um, to get access to information. If you've made it this far into the show, it means I must be doing something right. Kibbe on Liberty is just one of the amazing products we created for the people. We tell emotionally compelling stories and produce educational videos for the Liberty Curious. Our award-winning documentaries personalize all things Liberty, independence, creativity, hard work, integrity, and perseverance. After the show, check out our work at freethepeople.org. And if you like what you see, donate to support what we do. That's freethepeople.org. Now back to the show. Did... Um on the broader question of the concessions that um, McCarthy made to Chip Roy and others, are there is there anything that gets us closer to a more normal, transparent budgeting process? Because the you know the original fight with Boehner was the the clamping down on on the the, the rights of of individual members to mm-hmm. offer amendments and and to actually go through the budgeting pro, 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 uh, subcommittee by subcommittee in the Appropriations Committee. Is any of that going to get back to normal? Can do we, Or do we have to wait till New Year's Eve to see what multi-trillion dollar um, omnibus you guys are going to offer up? Um, there's a lot of good stuff on the budget process in this agreement. Um, and it's a, it's a framework. Like, a lot of it hasn't been reduced to text that's voted in as a rule, the ultimate uh, assurance that the rebels got is the reinstatement of the motion to vacate, with and one member can call it. Um, Pelosi had, you know, and, and maybe Paul Ryan, but I think Paul Ryan instituted some rule that said if you do it and you don't have a majority of the conference, you're going to be kicked. You're no longer a Republican. Okay. <laughs> But then Pelosi went even further and said, and just took it out she of the formal, rules. Yeah, she formalized it. Yeah. yeah, she formalized it in the House rules, not the conference rules. Well, we, the Republicans, we, not only did we put it, take away the prohibition within our conference that you wouldn't, you'd no longer be a Republican if you did this. They, we took away, we, they reinstated it in the House rules back to sort of Jefferson's idea, Thomas Jefferson's idea of how it should work. And uh, so that's their ultimate guarantee that they'll get these things that have been agreed to. It's sort of, the, it's, but it's like a, it's a nuclear option. Right. Um, so one of the biggest changes that I'm a big fan of, and some of our colleagues are not going to like it, and some of the Democrats are going to like it, um, is going back to uh, an, what's called an open rule on the appropriations bills it's not really an open rule. When they say open rule, they mean we just follow the rules we have. Okay, so <laughs> we're going to follow our rules. Super radical for the <laughs> Super house. Super radical notion. Follow our rules on the appropriations bill. So there'll be twelve of those, and each of those that come to the floor, any of us, any of the right now we have four hundred thirty-four members. Any of the four hundred thirty-four members can write an amendment of the form. It has to be of this form. It's, it has to be germane to the bill, right? It can't be creating a new law, and it can't be spending more money. Those are the constraints, but it can cut money. So if you uh, if you find there's a study on 
mating habits of cocaine, you know, infused uh, frogs in Brazil. Which is a real program, perhaps. (laughs) The scary thing is I got 90% of a real program expressed there. I think it was birds, not frogs. But (laughs) But there's something with frogs. Yeah. You could you can go to the floor. You can handwrite an amendment under these rules that says none of the money hereby appropriated can be used to fund cocaine, you know, infused f- frogs in Brazil and to study their mating habits. You put that up for a vote. Here's the scary thing. It'll probably fail. <laughs> Cuz when when we used to have this, here's how it would fail. The Democrats always want to spend money, so they vote against it, and then there are enough Republicans on the appropriations committee who, who may not think that's the greatest program ever, but they don't want their bill changed at all. They don't want anybody mucking with their finely tuned agreement. Well, there's got to be vote trading, too. Like, you, you vote for my stupid project, and I'll vote for yours. I know mine's stupid, Oh yeah, please right. vote for it. Yeah, so yeah. most of the people on the Appropriations Committee are locked and loaded, and they've all made agreements like you expressed. Yeah. It, you know. I'll vote for your butterflies, and you vote for my frogs, and he'll vote for the squirrels, and, you know... <laughs> All of God's creatures will enjoy magic mushrooms and will make sure they can still mate under these I, conditions. I feel like you're giving someone an idea for a new program. <laughs> so uh, they, these amendments will often fail. And uh, a rare one does pass. And, you know, I had some on hemp. I had one pass on hemp where the DEA, after we had legalized hemp in the Farm Bill, the DEA came back and asserted their authority to keep the state of Kentucky from receiving hemp seeds from Italy or something, and they impounded them. So I offered a, an amendment to defund that the DEA's activities, and it passed. Now, it didn't matriculate into the final <laughs> uh, spending bill because the Senate didn't agree or whatever, but it didn't even need to. The DEA got the message and let the seeds go Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like before it got to that level. It's really important. Then there, there's no limit to the number of amendments, other than people just start getting mad at people for offering amendments, and it's three in the morning. And I'm okay. old enough to remember this this tedious process of budgeting, where where everything is 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 on the table, and you you have to go through this again and again. Here, here's here's why it ostensibly why it ended. I think this was all fabricated. We could have gotten past this, but uh, we got to a point on one of the bills. The Democrats offered an amendment that said no, none of the money hereby appropriated can be used to display a Confederate flag in a national cemetery. Okay, now you've got uh, soldier, Confederate soldiers. They were in the Confederacy. They were buried in this cemetery. You know, but they wanted to ban um, any Confederate flag being displayed on their grave. Enough Republicans voted for that that it passed. It became part and parcel of that appropriations bill. At that point, there were enough Southern Republicans who refused to vote for the appropriations bill if that amendment was in there. It was kind of like a poison pill, a distasteful pill. Yeah. And um, the whole process ground down. And and rather than make people vote, our leadership just pulled that bill we went into a conference and said all right that's in we're not doing this process anymore it's too dangerous to republicans to let democrats offer these evil you know amendments and they're just trying to twist us up my thought is just vote vote and if you can't if you if you ran for office did all that work and you're up here and you're afraid to take a vote on a confederate flag up down one way or the other vote present whatever there's still the present button just do something and is, let's move on. It is sort of your job to it's vote. It's our job to vote. Yeah. And this, when you give people the ability to legislate, this is going to happen. They're going to yeah. try and do political tricks. And you just got to get through it and be hope that the voters will understand when they write the hit piece that you either uh, didn't respect, you know, the... You know, the the people who were buried in these hallowed graves or uh, you're a racist because you wanted a flag display, whatever story gets written, you, you've got to take your message to the voter. Yeah. And it it's going to be a very slow and messy and politically packed process. But the alternative is that multi-trillion dollar mystery package that is introduced on Christmas Eve. 
the I, alternative is killing our country. Yeah. It's killing our dollar. It's killing everything. They How just, many trillions in the last three years in new debt? Like five, six? I can't. I can't keep track because. Yes, you guys. You guys have gone crazy. <laughs> Not just new debt. It's fake debt. Like for for the first time since I've been in Congress, and they started this with COVID, they're monetizing the debt, like most of the debt. Yeah, there was there was a little bit of this going on, where you know they print money and then borrow it. We borrow it from ourselves, and so it shows up on the on the debt ledger, but it's really printed money, and it's like this, it's the handshake between the Fed and the Treasury. That was that was my general take on. Like I, I wasn't an insider like you were. You were you were in there, trying to get something useful out of this speaker process, but my attitude on the outside is, we got to do something different. Like I I don't care if we if we break some dishes in the process. Like we got to do something different because, the insanity of monetizing trillion dollars of debt. Like we're just starting to see what that means in terms of of groceries, in terms of your ability to to heat your home, all that stuff. Like um, people are perhaps not aware that the budget process has direct and visceral consequences for your ability to raise your family. So something had to give. So just let me give you an example of a vote that needs to happen is on the money to Ukraine. The last three tranches of money that have gone to Ukraine have been part of a bigger package. And the you know, one of my senators goes out there and says, "There's over." Well, I'm not going to do any impersonations. <laughs> I, I've I saw, never I, done one in my life. I saw there's, the clip. There's overwhelming support. You know, our main priority in this bill was funding Ukraine. Okay, that's a disconnect. I've, uh, that's a disconnect from voters, and I could be wrong. I might maybe vote. Maybe it is an overwhelming priority of Americans is to get if this uh, omnibus bill was to get money to Ukraine. I don't think it was, but let's test it. Give us a separate vote. Yeah. So if somebody else doesn't offer it, you can be sure that I will offer an amendment when there's a bill that funds Ukraine to to say none of the money hereby appropriated can be used to fund Ukraine, or somebody may be more art artful and say none of the money hereby appropriate can be used to fund Ukraine without um, you know, an audit happening. Although it's harder to get that kind of language in because now you're legislating to some degree. But um, those are the kind of votes that can happen, not just on frog studies, but billions of dollars that are getting spent that American people. And if we don't carry the day, if we don't win, at least there's 434 people on record of what they support and then y'all can sort it out in the next election. Okay, let's let's leave it there. I know you got to get up there and cause trouble. So thank you for doing this. <laughs> thank you. Good trouble. Yeah, good Thanks, trouble. Man. Thanks for watching. If you liked the conversation, make sure to like the video, subscribe, and also ring the bell for notifications. And if you want to know more about Free the People, go to freethepeople.org.